See, you know, we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I got a quiz up top for you. What is the best source of potassium on a keto diet? Live, everyone. Welcome to the show. Are you trying to get enough nutrients like vitamins and minerals on your keto diet? Do you worry about the health of our planet and sustainability of foods that you're eating? Then this episode is for you. Stick around and learn all about the, uh, oh, that sentence. I have a sentence here that doesn't make any sense. Learn all about the, uh, the, <laughs> the health benefits and how Alaskan seafood might be just the healthiest food you can eat on the on keto. Uh, your guest co-host today is Sina Wheeler of Sina Seafoods. Uh, welcome to the show. I want everybody to be engaged. And so those of you, I can see we've got people live right now. So go ahead and comment. Let us know where you're joining from. You're part of the show as well. We're so glad that you're here. Um, welcome to Keto Chat Live. I am your host, Carol Freeman. I have a master's degree in nutrition and clinical health psychology. I'm also a board certified uh, keto nutrition specialist. And just so we're protected, my lawyers want me to share this uh, show disclaimer with you. This show is meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice nor intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any condition. If you have questions or concerns related to your specific medical condition, please, please seek out proper medical care. Seek out your qualified functional medicine care professional. So um, thank you, Sina, for being here. Um, Hi. Hey, yeah, I'm super glad to be here. Thank you for including me. Wonderful. Great. Um, quiz for our viewers, listeners. Um, fun little quiz for you here. So which has more potassium per 100 gram serving? Go ahead and give me a comment. Uh, let me know which your guess is. Alaskan salmon or a banana? Imagine you've got the pile of the same weight. 100 grams of a banana or 100 grams of salmon. Which one do you think has more potassium in it? And um, so let's uh, let's check in with our our uh, special guest co co-host here today. Let's uh, let, let's introduce um, introduce you to our group here. So um, welcome, Cena Wheeler of Cena Seafoods. Um, tell us a little bit about about yourself. How did you get involved in what you're doing? And um, yeah, well, um, I have. A it's been a lifetime of being involved in fish. So I, I wouldn't say no choice, but all, all directions have led me basically to where I'm at. Um, kind of the, the real quick background, my, my grandfather immigrated from Norway um, and started fishing out of Ballard in Seattle, which is kind of a, a hub for um, Norwegian immigration at the time. And as his brothers come over, everybody gets a boat. So that's kind of our our history. We say we're three generations of fishermen, but my dad jokes that it's probably more like 300 um, oh, because that wow. doesn't count our, our Norwegian history as well. So um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and my dad was a fisherman. I guess what's kind of uh, fun about that is that um, my dad is a son-in-law, so it's actually my mom's side of the family. So I'm actually come from my mom who's a fishing wife. My grandma was a fishing wife and I'm a fishing wife. So my husband now fishes um, as part of the family business. Um, and so we basically um, just go find a fisherman to marry. <laughs> <laughs> we just we outsource the fishing part of it uh, okay. for our family tradition. It's kind of it sounds weird the way I said it, but <laughs> but I've been involved in fishing, eating fish, um, growing up eating fish. My mom um, owned a health food store, and my dad fished, so we ate healthy food and um, lots of fish growing up. So that's mm. that's kind of um, my upbringing. Uh, did you want me to move into? education and that kind of stuff uh, yeah just a moment let me welcome Valerie's here she's one of our regulars so she says hello ladies i'm going to guess salmon has more potassium than banana we'll 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 tease it i won't get reveal the answer here uh for a little bit longer but thanks for chiming in valerie so glad you're here and uh yeah yes yeah, so, well i want to know a little bit more asina then about like so what was it like growing up where so it seems like when people grow up with a healthy food environment, it can go one of two ways, right? <laughs> Either you embrace it, you're healthy most of your life, you, uh, you know, that's just a family uh, dynamic, 
Or sometimes it goes the other way where you're like, you rebel and you go off to college and you're like, you know what? I want to eat all the junk food in the entire world and <laughs> you never come back. So what was it like growing up with this, um, you know, long history of, of fishing and healthy foods in your family? How did things go for you when you went off to college? Uh, for me, I would say that that healthy eating just it's like you would want for your kids. It, mm -hmm. I grew up with it. It's very normal for me. Um, it's, I embraced it. I, you know, as I remember being, um, it probably in middle school was the time that I was like, I remember there was candy bars for sale in middle school. And I'm like, oh my gosh, a whole candy bar, like for one person, I'm just going to buy it and eat it, you know? So I recall that being very exciting. Um, I probably only ever bought two candy bars <laughs> because it probably made me feel horrible and I didn't do it again. <laughs> so um, I think that when you realize how good you feel when you're eating healthy, you know, you you uh, you might try eating unhealthy and realize that it feels like crap. And so that's that's for me. It just really it's just really natural. It feels feels good and feels right to me. I have um, sisters. I'd say that most our family continues and my siblings continue to eat healthy um, just because that's, it, it feels right. I would say. I love that you shared that. Thank you for sharing that so much because um, you know, so that's an example of how like you ate really well your whole life. So I, I'm working with a lot of um, people, especially ladies that, you know, maybe they didn't have the healthiest uh, upbringing and so we have to work a lot harder at getting to that healthy space and we maybe not ever have such a flexible diet. So I can imagine that you growing up in the environment that you did, you probably have some more flexibility in your food choices. Uh, whereas um, those of us that I'm working with on keto need to be a little more restrictive in what we're eating in order to achieve the same health. But I also want to point out too that how, um, how because you did have such a healthy base in your childhood that when you ate something that wasn't so healthy for you, you could choose to go back to your healthy eating roots because it just didn't feel as good to eat those things. So I want to really highlight that for our moms that are watching and grandmothers because a lot of people fall in the trap thinking, well, when kids are young, they should get to eat whatever they want and like mm -hmm. they should eat all the crap because they can get away with it. But you're a really good example of how when you make that healthy base for people when they're young, it, they just keep eating really well because they feel so good and they can notice that really stark difference. So I encourage yeah. everyone listening, um, give your, give your kids the healthy upbringing like Cena had so that, um, that, you know, they can continue to choose foods that make them feel really good. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah. Um, when, thank you. I, I agree. And I have three kids and, um, every, you know, I raise them with healthy eating as well. And I, I feel the same way. It's a foundation to fall back on. Um, you know, they might indulge at a friend's house or this or that. And I usually ask them afterwards, um, how do you feel? Mm. And they can notice how they feel and they don't feel that great. And that's all I leave it at that. I don't go, geez, you know, it's the guilt trip or anything. It just, just that conversation on how do you feel after you, after that, you know, it just can slowly sink into their, their brains. And it's really interesting to watch that, but they, but when you feel good, it's easier to notice when you feel bad. If you feel bad all the time, you don't, you might not get the opportunity to, to feel what it feels like off of the, the sugar and whatnot. Yeah, that's so true. And kids, when given the choice, and especially the way that you're framing of like, just how do you feel? Kids want to feel good too. And right. you're right that they can, when they're asked those questions and it's not a mandate that you're not allowed to have that, or you have to eat this broccoli or something like that. Um, kids choose feeling good. And so <laughs> good job, mom. Good job. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> Uh, yeah, so let's let's chat about your education. So, um, you know, Cena and I in our pre-show chat we had discovered we had a lot of this similar background. So Cena went to school at Oregon State University, where I actually have a little bit of schooling as well. Um, so was it just a no-brainer where you're like, well, this is the family business that I'm going to go get a degree in something that's related to this? Or was there a longer path? Um, share with us how did you pick out your um, your schooling? Um, I, 
you know, I chose nutrition just because I took a class and loved it. And I, at the time, I just said, oh, well, this is, you know, nutrition is for me. I, this is what I would look into or understand or, or enjoy on my own. And, and I never thought of the, the path, like, that I would loop back around into fish and fishing. I, I just thought of it completely separate, that it just made a lot of sense. The things I'm learning just lined up with how I was raised. And so to read about, um, you know, nutritional concepts was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. I love it. So I just felt like um, it, it really uh, resonated with me. And in fact, I always I love to tell college students, everybody should take nutrition. Uh, we're all humans and we all need to feed ourselves <laughs> and, you know, sometimes a family. So um, it, it just felt, I mean, actually it felt personally indulgent to me to get to study, uh, you know, nutrition. So I really, I really enjoyed um, that. And I did that for my undergrad. It was a nutrition and food science track um, right at the end um, in the program I was at, you choose to do the RD path, um, registered dietitian where you'd be in a hospital and I did my um, a residency in a hospital or my internship and decided that um, a hospital wasn't really where I wanted to be um, and then at that point I took I took kind of a hard left and went into food science um, and I I loved all my science courses too so for me it's those a little bit more hard science um, that that was kind of interesting things you can test things you can get results from and and you know, tangible. I I would say. So at that time, I went into um, I went to Oregon State and got a master's in um, food science. And and in, and then again, it, it was like a, a stumble into fisheries because to get my uh, a master's degree, you need to be um, have an advisor and approved and have a professor that says yes, I want to take you in and you know a research professor. And so I, I um, was looking online and, and a professor was looking for a student and, and he was in fisheries and food science and he's looking for a student that would be comfortable going on a fishing boat and comfortable working with fish. And I, it was like, oh, that's right. a no brainer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I sent one email and just said, oh, you know, here's my fishing background. I had been already going up and, um, fishing on my dad's boat in the summers through high school and college. So I'd already had lots of fishing experience being on the boat. So I sent one email and he said, great, uh, you know, sign you up. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's kind of like destiny. All right. I guess that's, I'm, I'm going right. to stay in this field. Right. Um, and so um, again, I didn't even see myself doing fish per se, I thought, well, this is a great way. You know, he also had a, um, a scholarship and a stipend available. It was a great way to get my um, graduate degree paid for um, through this research opportunity. So for me, it just felt like an end to a means or, you know, means to an end, however you say that, but it, it just felt so right. I didn't even think through like, oh, do I want to be in fish for the rest of my life? It just felt right. And so I did it. And, um, and here I am, really utilizing that information. I was studying of all things. I was studying uh, and quantifying the omega threes in the fish. Hmm, so, so yeah. So now I feel like, Oh, wow. Uh, you know, when you look backwards, it makes more sense sometimes, but um, it, it's, and I follow my gut a lot of times. So. Hmm. Oh, that's great. Welcome again, everyone who's watching. Let us know where you're joining from. Give me a little comment and we'll welcome you to the show here. So, um, all right, so Valerie, you are the winner. You did the quiz correctly. So it's a, you know, if it's a keto show, it's kind of a trick question, right? But um, for, if you missed the quiz, I asked which has more potassium, a banana or salmon, 100 grams of each. And actually, it's the same sort of serving size. And I only say this because um, so many people who are not on keto or not a nutritionist or a nutritionist that has done keto think that um, keto is is nutrient deficient, that there's no way that if you're limiting carbohydrate foods that you can possibly have all the vitamins and minerals that you need. Um, you know, people always say, well, what about potassium? You need bananas for potassium. But the truth is, is that bananas have just been a, a product of a brilliant marketing um, 
you know, that was out there for Chiquita bananas and everyone, everyone associates bananas with potassium, right? So in order to sell lots of bananas and the order for people to identify saying, oh, breakfast, I need a banana is because of marketing being told that bananas are really high in potassium, right? So every hotel breakfast that you go to is going to have a whole pile of bananas. Never mind that they're out of season, that they have to ship them from who knows where and all the impact to the environment. People have no problem with that. Um, but uh, it turns out that uh, salmon is a much better source. All fish is a really great source of potassium. And so uh, my early on in my journey of keto, I tracked all of my food and put it into chronometer, my favorite tracking software. Cause I was just, I was worried myself, like, is this a nutritious way of eating? And I found that it's very easy, especially if you're focusing on real whole foods as uh, on your keto lifestyle, it's very easy to get all your vitamins and minerals met. So potassium is just one of the example. Um, so a hundred grams of bananas, banana <laughs> has about 358 milligrams of potassium, a hundred uh, grams of salmon, 429. And I'll tell you what, so portion of salmon, you're probably going to eat around 100, maybe 150 grams. So you probably would eat even more than you would of a banana, especially on keto. Um, and here's just a fun one I throw in as well is that what's even higher in potassium, the bananas or salmon is avocado, another food that's keto friendly as well. So it's actually pretty easy to get your potassium needs met on a keto diet, especially if you enjoy uh, fish and seafood. So um so Ooh. let's see. Well, I love that because I have a recipe. Sorry to jump in. I have a recipe on our website for salmon with an avocado topping, and it is Ooh. amazing. And it's my kids' favorite. So that's a really nice combination there. That's great. So I uh, usually do a little personal check in here, and I kind of skipped over that. But uh, speaking of avocado, you can see some of my background here. Funny story with those. And then so I just celebrated my 51st birthday and I did a week long road trip to Grand Canyon National Park, um, Horseshoe Bend, Zion National Park. I met up with a friend of mine. So Cena's is up in the Seattle area and I met a friend of mine that lives in Seattle currently. She drove her camper van down. We met up in Zion. And so this is one of the things she gave me for my birthday was a little avocado necklace. And it's like, oh, that's perfect. So cute. And um, these avocados, uh, they're stuffed ones. It's backwards, so I point the wrong direction. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, one of them I just got for myself because I thought it was adorable. It actually has like a little face on it. And then last year for Christmas, my sister, one of my sister's boyfriends, um, we did a secret Santa thing and he sent me one of these. And I was like, oh, how perfect it is that I already even have one. <laughs> like, that's how appropriate it was that that was purchased for me. So av avocados are close to my close to my heart. So I'll have to check out the... Um, avocado uh recipe on your website so that your recipe is um cena seafoods.com cena c so cena c yeah sca here let me do a little banner here so that people are um yeah s-e-n-a s-e-a dot com we'll put this on here so that people can see cena c.com oh, yeah. and recipes are on there well let's just talk about that for first then so like a lot of people are intimidated by fish they think they don't like it um or they're they they don't know how to cook it so what do you what do you got for us there yeah you know i find that's usually people's kind of biggest issue is is what am i going to do with it how am i they just just that comfort level in the in the kitchen um and it's it's actually very easy once you get your hands on it and get used to it. So I would just really welcome people to give it a try. One of the things that we do in our, when we send fish to your door, it comes frozen. We have a little um, handling card. So it basically just tells you, um, you know, put it in the freezer, how to defrost it. I like to defrost it um, in cold water. So all of our portions are vacuum sealed um, individually. And so they, I can put them in cold water and they're defrosted within like 30 minutes. And so that's really nice because I can never remember to pull things out of the freezer like a day in advance. That's that's requires a lot of advanced thinking. So um, so I like that it's really easy to defrost. I basically start defrosting it and start looking around my kitchen and go, OK, what am I going <laughs> to what am I going to put together here? Um, and we have a lot of recipes on our website as well, like we mentioned. Um, one of the things 
is uh, we have an email list. People jump on the email list and we have a downloadable cookbook and it is um, how we cook the fish. So we, we work at, we, especially starting out, we were at a lot of farmer's markets. We were in the Seattle area and we did a lot of um, big Seattle farmer's markets. And a, one of the main questions people would ask over and over is how do you cook the fish? And, and they know, how do you cook the fish? Me being in a you know third generation fishing family, they want to know what we're doing at home. So we have a downloadable cookbook that is basically all the tips and tricks and and primary recipes that that we really do at home. So that's kind of that's kind of nice to have. Um, but mostly, I say, jump in there, grab some fish find a recipe and give it a shot because it really is not as hard as you might be thinking. Valerie's got a tip here for us. Her kids love salmon nuggets where she simply pan sautés cubed salmon in a bit of ghee. I bet that tastes delicious. Thanks for Ooh, sharing. That is that. good. My same thing. We do, uh, we chop it up into some cubes and if it's bite size, kids love it. It's magical. <laughs> And let's see. Um, so what kind of, what kind of fish? Oh, oh, wait, I thought of another question I want to ask first. So do you have a sense? Cause it's interesting. Um, it seems like somewhere along the way we lost touch with love of seafood, right? Like there's a lot of coastal areas. Uh, you know, a lot of people in the U S come from areas like, um, you know, Ireland and European countries where they have a lot of seafood. But even, um, you know, southern countries, there's a lot of coastal areas and a lot of seafood and fish. And I was struck at how many people, you know, I lived in the Seattle area for 27 years and grew up in Oregon, very, you know, right on the coast country, countries, states, and just how many people, like, say they don't like seafood. Like, do you have any sense of, like, where did people lose touch with enjoying, you know, such a uh, delicious and nutritious natural food? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, kind of the losing touch. Um, you know, for me, in my perspective, I come from this like multi generational seafood family. So for me, it's it's like uh, I know what you mean. We when you grow up eating it, and the people around you eat it, and there's this great love for it. It, it feels it feels festive. You know, king crab or oysters. You know, there there's a lot of um, tradition around different types of seafood, and a lot of um, love for it. And so I know what you mean when people just kind of do this blanket, like, nah, I'm not really into seafood. And it is surprising, um, it, especially if you're talking about the Seattle area, Oregon area, where on a coastal town, it, it should be kind of a little bit more ingratiated into um, kind of the way people are brought up. And my, my best guess is really just like big egg or or big beef, um, you know, is in industrialized to a certain extent so that even if you live on the coast, you can live in Seattle and and not know a fisherman or a source to get fish from mm -hmm. um, because those fishermen are selling to, uh, you know, uh, um, what I uh, just totally lost the word, but a middleman mm. who's then selling to big brokers. And so you could be in the same town that the, the fisherman comes in, he's got the fish, he sells to a middleman, it goes to a broker, it might work its way back around to the restaurant or even the grocery store next to you. But it's a very convoluted chain and the and consumer is really in the dark and not sure how to get involved in that. And so fishing is one of those things. It's, it's difficult. You have this... Um, you know, fish is very um, perishable. So, uh, you know, it's not often, we don't have this great setup for just like walking down on the docks and buying fish. So it really becomes this, this disconnect for understanding where you get the fish, you know, how, how you get it, what types of fish are even available. And I think that we're seeing it, um, you know, across the board with with same thing, vegetables and meat is it's it is that disconnect, and it's really fun to to connect people back together with those food sources. Um, we find that people are really interested in uh, the lifestyle and how we fish, and just well, what other species. And once when, when somebody kind of takes a step in, it's like, oh, this is really interesting and it's really delicious and and all of those things. So um, we are involved in a lot of. Um, farmers markets. I think I mentioned that before, especially, well, limited now, but pre-COVID, we did a lot of farmers markets. 
And I really liked being in the culture of the farmer's market. It felt like a really good fit for us because they're, they're people that are interested in the seasonality and the connection. And then we're here being fishermen saying, hey, we have seasonality and connection as well. And people, it's like, oh, hadn't thought of that. I just, I just saw a filet fish at the store. I hadn't, you know, made that connection. So that's been really hmm. probably one of the most rewarding parts of what we do is connecting with our customers. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, you know, the, the processed food industry that's moved most consumers far away from the source of their food, right? And so, um, you know, if it's not processed and pre-made and you could throw it in the microwave, it's like, well, what do I do with this fresh piece of fish, right? right. Um, they probably, most people these days don't even know what do it, like maybe fresh, fresh piece of chicken or how to cook a steak or anything. So uh, it's um, probably a big part of why they, they, lost touch with that or why they're not as adventurous like isn't it funny to think that seafood is considered adventurous when it comes to eating for some people um right yeah and 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 i really like what you said about i mean it's it, it really what you'd expect out of a coastal town is is not really even there so, you know everybody is like a mainland main <laughs> mainland person you know with the, losing that connection now you you um People can get fish delivered right to their door from you. Do you do nationwide? Do you do international? Like how far are you shipping your fish? Yeah, we ship nationally. Um, so we really focus the lower 48. Um, it, it's a bit ironic because our fish comes out of Alaska. We, we ship it down and, and we live in Washington state. So that's where we ship out to the lower 48. And it's really about accessibility getting fish right to people's door. Um, you know, I get these great emails from people in the Midwest that are saying, wow, this is incredible. I, I literally cannot get Copper River where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And so to have this source that comes to my door is is really incredible. And, and you know, that's why we're doing this. When we first started out, it's, you know, we're, we're really spoiled. Um, with what we have in our freezer. My kids have, they were, um, they couldn't have weed or dairy and I'm cooking from scratch a lot. And, and just realize, especially when you are dealing with dietary constraints, just having access to really high quality food is a really big deal. It's, it makes mm -hmm. a really big difference. And so when we started this, we wanted to get our fish out to people, um, you know, independently to their door without, a, you know, a grocery store or, or kind of like three middlemen along the way. Um, so we ship nationally, we ship overnight. Um, our fish is, um, is frozen. So I guess I don't want to just dive into the next topic, but <laughs> it comes frozen in six ounce portions and it's vacuum sealed and it makes it really approachable for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look around, I see how many people we have for dinner. I pull that many portions out of the freezer uh, right then. So it, it's very approachable that way. You don't have to have this whole fish or this whole filet and go like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, just for viewers and listeners, uh, Sina graciously sent me a box of um, fish to try. So, oh my gosh, so good. But also just to let you guys know, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, it's not the dead of summer. Um, it still was, so I, it was maybe about a month ago. So we're in December here, but act, actually I think it was in o late October that I got it. I think it was, I had it before the beginning of November. Anyways, arrived at my doorstep, completely frozen. Like there was no issues at all. Um, very well packaged. Uh, each piece was still very frozen, even though it was in the probably 90 degrees during the day in um, the Phoenix area. So you should feel very safe about, you know, ordering it and it's going to arrive in really great condition. Um, there were some recipes that came in the box too. So um, I did try one of them. It was a um, salmon with dill, um, like a dill soup. Not salmon, sorry, um, uh, sea bass. And, uh, or oh, halibut. 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 halibut with dill. And I keto fight it, so it, it's a regular dish that would the soup would be a, like a potato based soup. And all I did was sub out um, cauliflower in there, and I'll tell you, it turned out amazing. Now um, I didn't have maybe as much dill as what um, you know 
maybe it called for, but I also know like your food photographer is beautiful, right? Like this bright green in the picture. <laughs> and so when I made the soup, it wasn't that like spectacular bright green color. So when I took photos of it, I'm like, that doesn't look as pretty uh, as your, your, your food photographer's photos of that recipe. But I'll tell you, it was a, it was amazing. Um, so good. So the recipes are really great with it as well. And was, you know, fairly easy to make too. So um yeah, so Cena invited me to actually rewrite that as a keto version that could go up on the website too. So um, I basically, I have to put plug it into an analyzer to check the macronutrients for people, um, but I'll, I'll send that over to you soon so that you can put that up for people to, people listening to the episode want to go check out the uh, dill and uh, halibut, dill soup with halibut. I forgot the exact name of the recipe. I was looking for the card. I, I actually it. can't think of the name. It is, it's a dill, it's, it, Dill, seems like it's dill, dill halibut soup. <laughs> I can't think of it either, but yeah, I would love, you know, we, we put up a lot of recipes. Some recipes are from customers, um, but I would, I'd love to show, you know, put that up and, and show how to keto eyes that recipe. <laughs> yeah, it was delicious. And it, it's got, you know, the finish on it is uh, some, you know, uh, pan fried um, pancetta, not pancetta, um, prosciutto. And uh, that just mm, nice little salty, crunch on top of that so um those of you joining us live welcome oh, we have some new people coming in so just give us a comment where you're joining us from and uh we're talking about the health benefits of sustainable seafood so what what types of fish do you do you offer at cena cena sea cena seafoods <laughs> <laughs> uh well we fish in alaska so everything that we offer is uh wild caught and it's sustainably caught and just a an aside all fish caught in Alaska is sustainably caught. It's written into their constitution and, okay. and the state of Alaska has a really tight management over their fish. So just when you're when you're looking for fish, if wild and sustainability is important to you, um, you know, for health or planetary reasons, you know, keep that in mind with the wild Alaskan. So everything on our site is wild Alaskan. We're fishermen ourselves, of course. Uh, we we catch salmon, halibut, and black cod. And then, um, and then the when we're long lining for the halibut and the black cod, it's actually bycatch. But we have ling cod, um, rockfish, and Pacific cod, and those those are caught alongside the halibut and black cod on the long line. So we're really um, into. Uh, utilizing the whole fish, but also util utilizing the full spectrum of species. So when we catch the fish, we're allowed to um, keep it, and we we sell you know all the types of fish that we catch. Um, and and really, it's for salmon. It's many varieties. So we have Copper River salmon, which is um, really popular because it's so delicious. Copper River, when when you're talking about salmon, it's like beef, the categories or the levels of quality, it all relates to the fat content. And when you're talking about salmon, uh, it's your fat content is omega-3s. And so that's even better because it's the healthy fat of omega-3. So you have your Copper River King, which is king is the top. So it's the most omega-3s and the Copper River Sockeye and then Copper River Coho, and we have some regular non-Copper River sockeye, and then we have um, black cod or sable fish, which is a, also a high omega-3 white fish, which is really amazing. And then we have, um, and I'm telling you in order from highest in omega-3s down, so after the um, black cod would be, we have ling cod, rockfish, and then you have halibut, which is a really lean protein, but also low in um, fat. Oh, wow. I didn't realize there were so many different kinds of Copper River salmon. And some of that came in my box. And I think I'm pretty sure I'd never had it in Seattle. I always knew it was like the big, you know, the Copper mm -hmm. River run came and it's the first catch flying in fresh to Seattle. And, and it was always a big deal. And the restaurants would have limited supply of it. So I felt very spoiled that you sent me some Copper River as well. So definitely a much, um, you can see the more marbling basically of the fat that was in Copper River compared to maybe what you're used to with regular um, salmon, if you've had that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, what you were just saying that I, I didn't know, I loved learning this, that all Alaskan caught fish is sustainable. That's such a cool thing. Um, another reason why, like, I always choose Alaskan salmon myself, just because of 
you know, what I know about the farm, you know, farmed salmon, first of all, it just doesn't taste as good. But now that I know that, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, how much <laughs> superior Alaskan salmon is for more reasons, too. It will always kill me, Cena, you know, when I was in a Seattle restaurant that was a mm. nation chain that in Seattle they would have a like Atlantic salmon that they were serving. Yeah. Um, I think it would surprise the most to people around the country to know that like there are Seattle restaurants that serve salmon that's not from Alaska just because it's, I don't know, part of their supply chain or something like that. And I was just always really right. disappointed. So um, I've got to say like the, sea the seafood here in Phoenix has been surprisingly good. Mm -hmm. There are several restaurants here that they fresh fly in their seafood every single day. And wow. so I found that some of it's even fresher than what I could get in Seattle because not everybody, not every restaurant in Seattle's bringing in fresh supply every single day. So um, very, um, so tell me, oh, this is a, this, hopefully you know this answer. What is, what is Scottish salmon? Is that from Scotland or is it a type of salmon? Because that's um, common here. So uh, just, just like I, I was going to jump in and say um, Atlantic salmon is, is a, like a, it's a code word for farm salmon um, because there's no wild Atlantic salmon anymore. Mm. And so um, farm salmon is usually labeled Atlantic salmon. So that's kind of a watch out um, on the farm. You know, if you see Atlantic salmon, it's it's farm raised and be wary if, if that's not what you want to eat. Um, and Scottish. In fact, you know, it's funny. Um, Norway is really big on farm salmon. So Norwegian salmon and Scottish salmon are often farmed as well. Okay. Okay. Now I know. No. Now I know. Sure. I ask the expert here. So I'm so glad you're here. It's my personal personal seafood consultant consultation here. So <laughs> Valerie's asking, uh, Sina, can you tell us a bit about why it's important to sustainably fish? Oh, yes. Um, so fishing sustainably basically means that that the catch uh, it, for us, uh, the word sustainable, I'm glad you asked that because the word sustainable is one of those words that can mean many things to many people and many genres and in many areas. So when you're talking about fishing, the term sustainable is really relating to um, how the fishery is managed. So the fishery is, is um, for salmon and halibut and black cod, they're, they're managed by species very individually. So uh, for salmon specifically, um, it's managed um, daily. So basically uh, they're, they're managing it at rates to make sure that there's enough population for the next year. So they're always, it's, it's a, the term is escapement. So they're, they're managing the amount of fish that's getting through the river up the river to then spawn and create the next generation of fish. The fish have about a four year lifespan. So it's it's the the creating the fish for the next four years, the four year fish. So anyways, they have um, pretty sophisticated, they have sonar all the way up the river and they have the opening date, for example, on Copper River, it's a really big deal. It's the first big commercial opening of salmon um, on the planet in the, in the springtime. And it doesn't just open, say, on March 15th. It opens when the fish come in the numbers. So they have a target numbers for where they should be hitting. They're watching the fish return. They're counting. And once they have like a million fish go by, they open for fishing. They're still counting the whole time. They'll open for 12 hours of fishing in certain areas. And only after the the escapement goes by, then they'll open up for the next, and a couple of days later for the next opener. So we never even know. We usually fish only t two times a week, but it's completely related to how many fish have already made it up the river to spawn. So it's not fishing first, it is escapement first, mm -hmm. it is managed for sustainability, just always making sure that the next generation of fish are making it up river before the, the fishermen are are catching it. And that's whether it's sport or commercial and it's really ingrained, you know, there is no, where we fish out of in Cordova, it's a small town. And when the fishery is closed, there's no Copper River available anywhere in the world. People would pay any price for it, especially, you know, Copper River King, but there's not a single fisherman that would ever be out there catching it because it would be such a, it would go against everything that fishermen stand for and fishermen stand for sustainability, especially when you're 
talking about these generational families, like, like what we're involved in, it's all about the sustainability. So that's, I guess I'm kind of sidetracking, but sustainability always means managed so that there's always enough future generation of fish. Sounds important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important, especially well, if you, uh, you know, are a fishing family or if you like to eat fish or just looking at the planet and, um, you know, the life cycles, it's, it's incredibly important. So, so fish is very nutritious. We talked about the omega-3 in it. Um, also excellent source of a, a complete protein. So um, people that are, uh, you know, pescatarian, they want to avoid red meat. I'm not a fan of avoiding red meat, but if that's something somebody wants to do, you know, fish is a complete protein, very concentrated source of protein, also a great source of vitamin D, B12, zinc, selenium. We talked about the potassium. But I think, I wonder if this has to do with why some people, like why fish fell out of favor is that, um, what about pollution? What about, uh, you know, toxins and things like that, that we've been throwing in our oceans and our fish? Like, um, I, I uh, have some things to say about it, but what, what, um, what is your take on, on that? Yeah, um, I think it's important to think about, and it's really, um, you know, looking at where fish is caught. So looking at the water that fish is raised in, um, you know, it, it makes perfect sense to me. If you catch a fish in polluted waters, that fish is going to have a level of toxins in it and that, and that that's a concern. So I agree with that concern and, and especially looking in the Seattle area and the Puget Sound, you look at a huge city with water right outside of it. And, and that is a concern. Um, I would say that that's, a, to me, and I don't want to sound like I'm a broken record, but it's another reason to look at Alaska. Uh, we spend the summers up there and it is this truly unbelievable, uninhabited place. Mm. So you have these pristine conditions that if you grow up in a city, you think they're long gone. You think this is like not real, but it's real. And up there is really pristine. So when you're talking about like the Copper River itself is a huge, long 300 mile river, the basin itself of the Delta where the water comes out and joins the, um, the ocean is they say like the size of Rhode Island. However, that is, it's like 300 miles. It's, it's huge area and there's no population. We, we fish out of Cordova, which is still, you know, four hours away from the fishing ground at least. And there's no roads in to this town is very rural. So you, so the waters here are unpolluted. You mm. have these rivers with no, there's no mining in the area. There's no dams in the rivers. There's no deforestation around because the, these rivers are kept intact for this important fishery. Mm. So it's really um, important to realize that, that, there's places like this still left on earth and that here's the flip. I like to say people worry about eating sort of like the last wild salmon, but it's actually in reverse. If, if you go to a restaurant or you spend money on that wild salmon in return, the Alaska is saying, okay, great. People value the salmon. We're not going to pollute these rivers. We're not going to mine on the river. We're not going to um, put up dams because these salmon are so valuable and so important. So it's actually valuing that life cycle and the salmon to make sure that we're we're doing everything in a way to make sure they come back. If that if that makes sense. Yeah, it's great. I uh, no, that's I I'm learning so much about Alaskan fishing. Oh, how ironic on a on a show talking about Alaskan fishing. <laughs> um, yeah, that's I just love hearing about how it's so protected and everybody that's there and participating in this fishing is so such a vested interest in keeping it, uh, you know, high quality and, and clean and sustainable. So, uh, so great. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the work of Chris Cresser and he had some articles, um, you know, a few years back just talking about like the, the, the nutritional benefits of what we get from fish far outweighs the risk of, you know, any toxic stuff that may, may be in there. So, um, and I think that probably goes with this as well. So Valerie's asking, um, people also mentioned mercury when they talk about seafood. Is that something to worry about? Uh, she says she eats seafood very, very often. 
Oh yeah. Um, that is an issue. And, and I've, I'm learning a little bit more about it. Um, that, that, that there's different people that are more sensitive or not to mercury, which I think is really interesting. And I hadn't really realized. Um, so when you're thinking about mercury, uh, what you want to think about is um, number one, you would avoid fish that are really big and live a really long time because those fish are eating other fish or smaller fish that are then the mercury levels are building up in their bodies. Um, so the other thing to think about, so it's the size and the basically the lifespan. And then the second thing is the omega-3 content. So it's it's interesting, but typically the, the mercury content is an inverse relationship with the omega-3 content. So the really high fatty fish. So whenever you're looking at a list of of, of the best fish for you know low mercury, it's always the high fat fish on the top of the list. So um, you get a double bonus when you're eating these high fat fishes that it's also inversely related to um, to mercury. Yay fat, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting, that's so great. Um, let's see, I think, so I think the one thing we wanted to mention as well too is that you guys have a subscription service for your, your fish. Oh, that? yes. Yeah. Um, what's So we have a subscription service. I It's available on the website. It, it's, you don't go anywhere special. It's when you choose any um, box of fish, you choose salmon or whitefish. We have this great box that is a seasonal variety. So you say, yeah, I want, you know, four salmon, four whitefish. And um, seasonal variety means it basically I call it Packer's Choice. You know, what, what fish we have on hand, we're going to give you. And that's what's seasonal. Um, and then if you you can buy anything one time. Oh, I really firmly believe that people should be allowed to try it and buy it. And we have a lot of customers that um, buy a lot and they just buy what they want when they want it. And that's mm. totally fine. Um, and then our subscription program right under where you buy the fish is a little subscribe and save. If you choose to, you can get a box once every one month, every two months or every three months, just depending on the size of your freezer, how much fish you go through. I recommend getting it less often and a bigger box. Um, and we keep it really flexible. So you want to change the kind of fish that you want. You want to change the box size. You want to change how often. I completely work with people. I'm emailing all the time. Um, and and I just try to dial it in because the point of the subscription isn't to lock people into something they don't want. <laughs> it is to have good high quality fish in people's freezers because if it's available, they'll eat more of it and they'll be healthier for it. So it's really just to be easy and to get the fish there and you don't have to think about it. You know, if it's there, you'll pull it out, you'll fix it and you'll love it. So that's, that's the idea there. Yeah. One of the reasons I love uh, the, the, the scene of fish, uh, the way you guys package it is that it really fits with what I teach my clients where you want to have meals that are quick and easy. And a lot of people don't think of fish, especially frozen fish as being something quick and easy. But like Sina said, the, each it's, it's already prepackaged for you. So this is a big um, one of the things I recommend for my clients is that buy things that are already pre-weighed, measured and cut for you. Um, so six ounce portion, perfect for uh, your keto meal. And like she said, even if it's frozen solid in your freezer, you can pull it out. It's sealed in, in, in plastic and you just put it in, you just run cool water on it or put it in a bowl of water and within 30 minutes, it's going to be defrosted that you can actually just cook it. And you can make it so easy that uh, you just heat up your hand, pan pretty hot, um, put some kind of oil in there, uh, bacon grease, some ghee, um, or and uh, just fry it first on the side that has the skin on it. So like just cook it as hot as you can on that side till it's done. Put a lid over it and basically, usually by the time it's it's, you know, I'm, you're going to press on the top and it's going to be pretty firm. If you're not quite sure, you can always just kind of flake it apart, pull it apart and just make sure that it's opaque. So basically that's how, you know, fish is done is that it's no longer translucent. Um, so as the, it's like so, sooner than later, right? So fish gets tough when it's overcooked, like most meats. And um, so it's much easier than you think. And usually, you know, five to 10 minutes is all it takes to actually cook it in a pan on the stove. Another uh, more foolproof way. So if that's intimidating for you, you can poach it. So that's just meaning you're cooking it in some kind of liquid. So some kind of broth, bone broth, um, 
That's the easiest way. Just heat up some broth in there, plop the fish in, just cook it on a simmer, um, you know, until it's, it's cooked through. So easy, foolproof. You can't burn it. And also it's a little, you, you almost can't overcook it that way as well too. Like, yeah, if you boil it for an hour, it's not going to be very good. But also that's another like super easy way that you can cook uh, fish. And it totally fits with my rules for my clients of find things that are really quick and easy that you can throw together. Um, and, you know, I encourage you to try some variety. Like uh, like we talked about earlier here is that a lot of people kind of just falling out of, um, you know, fish is not within their comfort level or for whatever reason, they're just not used to having it. Um, you know, that's why I wanted to bring Cena on here is to talk about how quick and easy this can be. And also it's going to bring you a lot of nutrients that you might not be getting from other um, types of protein choices that you're making. So um, anything else you wanted to cover today, Cena? Oh, I love it. That um, This has been really fun. I think that's really, um, really does cover it. I, I, you know, in my family, we joke because um, I call fish our fast food. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I can literally pull it out of the freezer and cook it. And if I, I can cook it, you know, and throw in some frozen vegetables, whatever, I can make it as fast as you could call a pizza. You know, it's, yeah. it's just that mental switch that... Mm -hmm this can be fast and easy it is just because you're cooking at home doesn't mean it was really challenging or you had to do a lot of planning. It's just having a couple quick and easy. I completely agree with that. Well, and I'll just add as well, I forgot to mention this, but you don't have to get any fancy seasonings, right? Like salt and pepper on it when it's cooking and that's it. Uh, yeah. You know, Garlic. Keto, people, keto, keto people just few slabs of butter on it after it's done as well too. You can finish it in the pan with butter or just put it on after it's done cooking. So, so easy, so delicious. You don't have to get too complicated. So, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Well, we talked about any, any last things you wanted to mention about how healthy how fish and seafood and Alaska food specifically is for you, for us? Um, you know, I guess one, one thing we kind of hit on, and um, one more Alaska hit <laughs> is um, I wanted to mention that uh, fish farming is actually illegal in Alaska. So it's never oh. been allowed in the state of Alaska. So it's another one of those kind of uh, points where it, it gets really complicated for people. It's like, well, I, I need to understand so many things to go to the store and buy fish. Mm -hmm. um, and really, so a lot of times I'm asked just kind of like, what do I look for? And I would say wild is number one to me because of the, the health reasons, as well as just the, the taste and quality. It, it's just it's the best and it's the best for you. Um, and then keeping in mind anything that says Alaskan is always going to be wild, sustainable and no farming. And and I guess the last hit on that is just that the fact that there's no farming in the whole state, even if you're buying wild, if it is um, spawned in the same river as fish farming, it can get disease and things from the fish farm because it's migrating past fish farms. So the fact that they're not allowed at all is is just one more step to keeping that that um, food source really pure. So I sound like an advertisement for Alaska, but what I'm trying to do is just demystify and make it simple. <laughs> yeah. Valerie says, like, I feel like I took a class. This has been awesome. <laughs> That's great. Oh, good. I'm glad you had the value in this. So uh, let's see. So thank you everyone for being here. Up next week, I'm actually going to have, we're going to be talking about keto pets and I'm going to have a keto pet food uh, dude on here. So I'm probably gonna, we're probably going to learn any more. Stay tuned for the class next week, Valerie. Um, so today we talked all about the health benefits for us, for our planet, how amazing Alaska is and protecting our valuable seafood resources up there. Um, and I want to mention our, our show sponsor, keto-space.com. Uh, they provide our show transcripts. So if you're reading on my website, um, they have generously provided full transcripts of this show so that those of you that can't listen can actually just read the entire transcript of uh, this fish class today. So uh, thank you again, Sina, for being here. And people can check out what you have to offer. Again, uh, SinaC.com. For those of you listening, it's S-E-N-A-C-S-E-A, -E 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 like the ocean, dot com. Uh, check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, thank you again, Sina, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is a really fun chat. I really appreciate it. Oh, great. And
thank you audience for being here. Um, share this episode with somebody who maybe is afraid of fish or wants a really good quality uh, type of fish that they can have in their life sustainable wild caught Alaskan seafood. Um, sharing is caring. So share this episode with a friend and remember help us grow the show and we'll help you shrink. Thanks everyone <laughs> for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.